correct. Good afternoon, friends. I'd like to welcome you today to What's in Tegan's Storage Locker. It's the show that dares to ask the question, just what is in my storage locker? The answer today, well, friend, the answer is comic books. The answer is probably always going to be comic books. Now, you may have no noticed posting has been a bit light lately. Uh, I have, if you haven't noticed, hopefully you haven't really noticed. I have updated the rig, and I had hoped that that would not uh, basically put filming to a stop while I figured out how to use a couple new tools. It basically uh, stopped my output. I've had to scrap multiple shows just for uh, needing to practice with a new microphone and learning how to use a monitor system. And ultimately, I did not end up spending too much money, don't get me wrong, but I, update, I upgraded just enough that every single step of the process became just a little bit more laborious. So the reason I started this whole thing to begin with was because it was really easy. I figured out how to make movies on my phone, but if I wanted to buy a microphone, I needed to upgrade past the phone stage. I hope you don't think any less of me. I've always thought in my online endeavors to emulate as I can the credo of bands like Sebado, uh, who were, at least in the very beginning, very defiantly uh, low fidelity. And I've, I've actually tried to do that consistently across you know, all my different internet haunts. I don't know if it reads the same way. Uh, now, as it did 20 years ago, when no one knows who Sebado is, you're probably looking them up on your phone, or you should probably schedule a colonoscopy. <laughs> hey <-o! laughs> The jokes aren't getting any better necessarily. So, anyway, if you like what I do here, I think about visiting the Patreon. Uh, if you like this show and want to see me do more of it, that's... That's how you express that emotion. I got tons of stuff to download there. Uh, decades of my writing uh, in various ebooks. I also have been putting up uh, videos devoted to new comics as well. It's called Hey Tegan, What's in the Bag? And I just, I try to spend somewhere around 20 minutes, although we never come in on time, just, you know, going through the comics that I buy, because I buy way too many comic books, as it is, and, uh, you know, I need to be able to write them off on my taxes, so I'm here to tell you folks about them. So, Batman Shadow of the Bat, 35. I think we've looked at an issue or two of Batman Shadow of the Bat. It was basically uh, Alan Grant's. Uh, pet title after his very well-received run on Detective Comics uh, in the very late 80s with uh, Norm Brayfogle. And that run was so well-received that they gave this man his own Batman book for a decade, basically just to do what he w wished with it. And he worked with great artists, and he did have to tie in with the crossovers. Uh, he didn't just get it completely to himself. But he was one of the men who, uh, one of the lesser sung uh, of the greats who really put a lot of work into defining Batman during a very popular period. And so going forward, you know, Alan Grant's going to be one of, really one of a fairly large handful, but still only a handful of people who have made lasting enough uh, contributions to the Batman mythos all on their sweet lonesome. And uh, although, you know, one of the reasons why is, is he worked with great artists. Shadow of the Bat, pretty much every issue had someone uh, worth picking up for. Brett Blevins, this is um, Barry Kitson. And the reason why I picked this out when I saw it was I realized, I've said actually, I think a couple times in passing, that I didn't think, I didn't think Barry Kitson was uh, particularly well suited to drawing Batman. And, you know, that's that's kind of true. I don't think that it was uh, his best character, but he really seemed to like uh, drawing Batman because he did a fair amount of it. 
uh, in the period when he was also doing uh, Superman. This may have been right after or maybe during the tail end of his uh, run on the Superman books during the 90s. Anyway, this is part of a crossover. So this isn't Grant unfiltered. This is Grant writing Troika, which was significantly the first real uh, story to feature Batman Bruce Wayne back as Batman since, I mean, they started to run him down in like 1990. Well, 1991, they were, I think, I want to say they started seeding that story as early as 91, but at least by 92, long before Nightfall started, Batman was exhausted for months. So basically for years, no one had had just a regular Batman comic book unconnected with any of the shenanigans of the crossover era. And this was, you know, more or less a, a new beginning for this period. And it turned out to be a very successful period. Bat, you know, the late 90s wasn't as successful as the early 90s for anyone. But uh, the Batman titles had a pretty good uh, 90s with a, a dip in the middle. This got the books off to a good start. I don't remember people caring one way or the other about Troika. Oh, I should mention before we move on, this excellent Brian Stilfrey's cover. Uh, he was one of, he didn't do, I, I'm trying to remember. I know he did a fair amount of Batman covers, but I couldn't give you a round number off the top of my head. But I've never seen a bad uh, Batman piece from him. And I know he did a, a, a fair amount of covers, uh, primarily, but maybe not entirely for Shadow of the Bat. I, like I say, I don't remember. And let us not pass over mention of Tech War the series starring William Shatner. Uh, I don't know if that was always the plan originally. I, it's been a long time since I read the first Tech War. Wait a minute, you read the first Tech War? Yes. I was like nine. You gotta give me a break. <laughs> but even at that age, I could tell like, oh, this is not very good. Maybe there's a reason why this is the only sci-fi book my grandpa could stomach. <laughs> it was very much like grandpa sci-fi. And it was, you know, the words, they taste like marbles in my mouth, but it, it was popular enough to survive significantly past whatever novelty his edition had. It is only a matter of time. You know it's only a matter of time before someone does it, and they'll do it ironically at first, but then the next thing you know, it'll take off and we'll have tech again. We'll have a, a tech problem on our hands. It's not very good, and yet it multiplies if you let it in. All right, so this is well, what, what part of the crossover? Two of four. So Batman, he's back. Uh, you know, Dick was filling in for a while, and everyone loved Prodigal. Everyone loved Prodigal. It, you know, it was the first time Dick was, was Batman. And I don't like Dick. I, I think I've made that abundantly clear. I don't particularly care for Dick Grayson as a character in the Titans, as Nightwing, but straight up put, put Dick in the Batman costume. Yeah, I will check that out. That is an interesting setup. Unfortunately, you can't do that, but every, like, decade and change... And, you know, it's been long enough. They could probably do it again. But the two times they've done it, both during Grant Morrison's, uh, tail end of Grant Morrison's run, and after the the first Nightfall, Night's Quest, Night's Ends, shenanigans, culminating with Troika, ultimately. Prodigal was, uh, you know, I've always thought of Prodigal. It, it seemed very fan service to me after a period where uh, they were testing the patience of a very devoted fan base by the end of all the night stuff. In a way that the Superman fans, they felt quite satisfied by Reign of Superman. And, ba and Batman was just kind of enervated by his whole thing. So, in essence, they needed to come out swinging. And I'm not, you know, Troika isn't, isn't great shakes at all. It's, I, I want to say it's like Russian mob stuff in Gotham, but man, you can see that they were putting their back into this. They had to just sort of establish how Batman, the real Batman who was back and was going to be back for the foreseeable future, he, he had to 
he had to update with the times. That was the whole point. And so if this is what a 90s Batman comic ultimately settled on. And it's a very handsome looking comic book. I, I think his Batman is just a bit too square jawed and broad shouldered. Uh, excellent. That's an excellent composition. He's taking some from Kelly Jones there. You can tell if you look at the way he's drawn uh, Batman's cape. Now this, you know, I am probably, we look at Lobo on the, on the TikTok a fair amount. You know that. At some point I'm going to dig this out because this is a wild, wild one shot. It, it's just this guy, Martin Emmon, working with Mr. Alan Grant. So straight up, why did Alan Grant write so many comic books for DC in the 90s? Because he wrote comic books. It sold pretty well. He wrote a lot of Lobo stuff. They made a lot of money off of Lobo. So, of course, they gave, they had no problems with the guy getting a Batman book. Yeah, he, he gave that company a lot. Wow, that is a nice-looking page right there. That's nice. Leaning into the, the black elements of the costume, but the big aesthetic movement for this comic was essentially that they were getting rid of of uh, the light gray and the blue. Those those colors weren't going to be on the character any longer. They were going with black on black. And it's not really black on black. This is a very, very dark blue, and this is a very, very dark gray, but, you know, who's counting? It essentially looks black at a scan, and that's what the fans were asking for. The fans were asking for this, more or less, the stark, uh, Mazzuccelli and Miller uh, influenced and Tim Burton influenced look of the character and there he was finally it took him a while and I don't want to pass up this opportunity to mention Catwoman it's on issue 18 it's still going and I mean it's going to keep going for the rest of the decade pretty much with Jim Balant Jim Balin pretty much at the helm because, you know, Chick, Chuck Dixon's writing this one. He wrote a fair amount. So did Devin Grayson. So did a, a few other people. Joe Duffy. Uh, it was definitely a period where the artist was the dominant uh, voice on a book by a wide margin. As, as strange as it sounds, Catwoman in hindsight was a book that gave Catwoman a uh, fair amount of credibility at the time when the company didn't necessarily have it uh, in a lot of other ways regarding cool. Uh, but they just happened to give this book to Jim Balin in time for it to just, I'm not going to say ride the, the crest because it was one of the leading movers of the bad girl's crest. It was at the head of that. Even though, you know, the Catwoman book, it had the code on it. It was still, you know, she was right next to, you know, Witchblade and Vampirella uh, on all that. And so it was, it was hard-fought success. This book had a fan base. This artist obviously had a fan base. Strong enough that they had to completely fumigate the place when he left and have pretty much just steered clear of the associations of this era since then, because, to be fair, the era that came right after, uh, you know, it went completely 180. It was, you know, led by Darwin Cook, even though there were a lot of people uh, involved in it. But aesthetically, at least, it was a complete 180, and it was really successful. And Jim Lee took that version of the character and, uh, you know, at least aesthetically, the look of it. And he really made it hit in, um, in Hush, too. So that look was cemented uh, for a long time to come because it was in a couple high-profile stories. And they needed to because this version of the character, this version of the character was the character, the character who had never sold before, looked like this. Uh, and the idea that uh, that one artist would be so dominant on the character, I think, is uh, something that it struggled to overcome. But now... I, I think history has come around a bit and, and shown, like, I cannot stress all the years DC could have been publishing a Catwoman comic. And it's not always their best-selling comic. 
but they have published a Catwoman comic book monthly, pretty much every month since the early 90s. And they got some good artists for it along the line. But ultimately what that tells me is that they probably could have been publishing Catwoman comics a lot earlier. And they just didn't think to. Okay. Oh well, that's the that's the comics industry for you. Now, to be fair, there was a there were rules that you actually could not use Catwoman for many years, but I think that's like seventeen years out of eighty. But again, it, it took DC uh, literally uh, decades to really cash in on the fact that the, the character was infamous enough that she had to be banned by the code for the better part of two decades. All right, so KG Beast, he's, uh, he was featured in the classic uh, Jim Starlin, Jim Aparo Jam, Ten Nights of the Beast, which actually is a very, very decent Batman story. Definitely, definitely worth picking up. The height, late 80s, Reagan era, paranoia, uh, basically just a Cold War thriller where this guy's trying to kill Reagan and Batman's the, 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 the guy in the way. Now, of course, you know, Jim Starl and Batman can be an acquired taste, I recognize, but Jim Aparo is, you know, my personal pick for the best Batman artist of all time. And Ten Nights of the Beast is a very, very respectable showing from him. So I don't know what's going on here. Wow, look at this Batman cape. Barry Kitson's really like, he's stretching on this one. I see lots of Kelly Jones, lots of Kelly Jones. And you know, Kelly Jones was reading, was, was drawing Batman at the time, I should say. He was uh, the artist up for the big chair in his run on Batman with, with Doug Mensch and Terry Beatty, which we've looked at on this show, and we'll probably look at again at some point. Uh, but it, it ended up being for a real oddball, and in some ways, look, version of the character. It ended up being really influential. Everyone wanted to draw these really long ears. Uh, and this, you know, this was what what the company's number one Batman looked like. Long flowing spawn cape with all these Kelly Jones ripples. And uh, Guy Gardner is still in his alien phase and crossing over with Green Lantern. Guy Gardner, I think it lasts another half year. I want to say it lasted into the 30s, but not too long after that. Uh... So, yeah, Batman's fighting some, look like, cyborg-enhanced goons or something. Something along those lines. He's still got an awesome cape, no doubt. Uh, oh, and I think maybe this is for the issue after this crossover. The Dark Knight finally returns in Detective Comics 682 by Chuck Dixon, Graham Nolan, and Scott Hanna. Uh, I bought, I bought that run. This did not really look like what Nolan's Batman came to look like. He he, his version I think was significantly sleeker. I, I want to say they were uh, maybe exaggerating the the fake muscle look uh, for a little bit at the beginning, but that didn't that didn't stick around. Yeah, so it's some sort of you know, Batman mystery, which is not a very decent mystery. <laughs> Uh, it's still a decent subscription uh, uh, form for 95 yeah. It's not going to be this long for long. But they've still got two Star Trek books, and they would not keep the Star Trek license for very long after this. Uh, the Ray, Primal Force. I don't know how long Manhunter. Manhunter may have lasted like 18 issues, something like that. At least some of it had Vince Girano on it who in hindsight is, is more interesting than I gave credit at the time. All right. Oh, there's a Joey Marchese letter. Zero Hour was brilliant. Oh, no, that's Rob Sinclair. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. That's Rob Sinclair. I don't mean to slander Joey Marchese. Sure. Shadow of the Bat Zero didn't blow me away like Doug Mench's Zero Issue of Batman did. It seemed like Doug with artist Mike Manley has told us 
has told it all about the Dark Knight's history, uh, but Alan Grant is still full of surprises, so the untitled gasp story of number zero proved. Okay, well, it sounds like it'll be mostly a softball. Yeah, I, I never could make it as a letter hack. I, I can never think of any interesting way to, to, to spin all the... Uh, they ended up being too short. And the thing with the letter hacks, the, one of the reasons why they ended up being published so long is because if you wrote in, you know, this is two-thirds of a column, well, there you go. That's uh, a third of your, your column right there with something that, you know, takes maybe 45 seconds to read. But it's, you know, value added to the comic book. Letters pages, they, uh, they add something. They do. You can't say you don't, even if you maybe didn't read every letter, you know, all that closely. It was cool that they were there. You know it's true. It doesn't feel right when they're gone, and you appreciate the people who still take the effort to put them in. G.I. Joe, the, 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 the ham of G.I. Joe, it's publishing like three or four pages of letters, I think. They're right there. Tells me, well, that series is loved. So, you know, maybe it'll stick around for a while. All right, so the DC Universe page is... Uh, well, they're just, it's basically just uh, promoing stuff coming up with some really tiny uh, sketches of art and, you know, show Metropolis Alive 95. So I guess they had the Superman characters headlining the Showcase 95. Uh, Man, Showcase, I don't even remember the circumstances that led to me buying or not buying Showcase, because I'm always surprised to find I bought more of it than I remember, but I don't remember where I bought it or anything that was in it. It was really just, uh, you know, okay, it was obviously trying to fill that Marvel Comics Presents shaped hole, because Marvel Comics Presents, for at least a few years, was a tremendous success, but it sold well, because it was a book with the name Marvel Comics Presents in the title that usually had an X-Men on the cover, usually Wolverine. And he was a, he was a character that did extraordinarily well, uh, direct and newsstand sales. And apparently, Marvel Comics Presents was a newsstand juggernaut until the mid-90s when the newsstand stopped. I'm not going to say it stopped, because the last time I ever saw a comic book uh, in a spinner rack in a grocery store. It was 2003. I read the last couple issues of the Grant Morrison X-Men in a, off a spinner rack in western Massachusetts in the early 2000s. But that was it then. Occasionally, like... Oddly enough, Marvel made a couple attempts at a black and white magazine in the in the late 2000s that would go on the newsstand, and the newsstand, you know, it was an attempt. It was something. They're not doing anything now. I think even if they had anything, that would matter. And yet they just, they gave up. But the space is still there in every store. Every grocery store still has a newsstand. And they say, well, we can't make a product that's going to make money. You have a shelf that you could put something on. And you, if you can't figure out how to make money on it, you should not be in magazine publishing. I'm sorry. Put something, man. For your own self-respect. If nothing. Uh, this is the... This is the Ep the Elric book that I got that I, I dove into so enthusiastically and just because everyone everyone this was you know after Neil Neil Gaiman after Grant Morrison after many others were dropping this guy's name left and right finally I get around to it and just like a like a empty swimming pool I just there was nothing there for me to hold on to. I need to go back to it, is what I need to do. Maybe I'd appreciate it more. Oh, 
Oh, one of the, is this the second Tales from the Crypt movie? I want to, or the first? I'm trying to remember. This one had, this one had a nice cast. Uh, Billy Zane, William Sadler, Jada Pinkett, uh, at least uh, Thomas Hayden Church. I mean, you know, yeah. He did garbage. Thomas Hayden Church? He was, he was nobody from Nowheresville on some of the worst TV you've ever seen in your life until inexplicably once he just got a real fastball of a script and then he's, he's a decent actor. He was not a decent actor <laughs> in the mid-90s. He became much better through hard work. Oh, hello. Hello. Well, are we in your way, young princeling? Would you like to read an issue of Uncanny X-Men? I know we just did Batman. I don't care. Because this, this is Joe Madureira, X-Men. Uncanny 312, cover dated May 94. So, wow, we're about to enter a very good year for the X-Men. And straight up, it is not a given that the X-Men... We're going to have a good 1994. Remember, all of their artists quit in 1992. How the hell would you expect them to be back on top of the heap? And yet, you got to blame inertia because people kept buying the books for long past the point where the books were good, were worth buying. That's just straight, plain, the fact of the matter. And I, I point the finger at myself. The art was still decent, and we loved the characters. And the cartoon, man, the cartoon was everything. So yeah, we forgave them a lot. And we were rewarded with this, this imperial phase. Once Joe Madureira shows up, uh, and the book really takes off. And, you know, it always takes off. It's always number one, but... It went into a period where it was, once again, setting the pace for the industry, which it just had not been doing for a couple of years after Chris Claremont. Say what you will about, about Chris Claremont, but he kept that book at the forefront of everyone's conversation for 17 years. And then after he left, they stumbled, and somehow people just kept going. Just like they kept going when they got John Buscema to draw the Fantastic Four. That's just the, the nature of the universe. Do I like that that's the way of the world? Maybe not necessarily. But at this point, you just have to set your watch by it. Even when the X-Men are terrible, they're still going to sell pretty well. And when the X-Men are even slightly readable, they will knock over everything else in their surroundings because people are just hardwired to love these characters. Generations, multiple generations, hardwired to absolutely love the X-Men, even though it's, well, maybe even because it has such a terrible premise. It does. I know, I've... I've said this before, but the, the mythos is wrought with contradictions, and I guess those contradictions are fairly fertile because some of the best X-Men stories, uh, I was going to say since Claremont, but even during Claremont, some of the best Claremont stories are about the contradictions at the heart of this central metaphor. And... You, whether you get it or you don't, you can't deny it. It really speaks to people in a way that, you know, few other things do. Spider-Man, Batman, and just mutants in general. Now this guy, this Joker here, we didn't know how good we had it. All right, so, Joe Madureira uh, with... Uh, Green, that's Dan Green, 
And I think uh, Henry Candelario, I want to say it's Henry. Chris Eliopoulos lettering, Steve Bucciolato coloring. So this is the last gasp before the, the computers arrive at Marvel. 94, yeah, I think they said that the computers really start coming in. 95, 96. Uh, and of course, Scott Lobdell is uh, writing uh, this era. So, it's a lot of spinning of wheels. Uh, so, we have Storm and Yukio. Everyone always likes Yukio when she shows up. And here they're fighting uh, the Phalanx. And that makes sense because the Phalanx, uh, they are, you know, primarily an X-Men baddie. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I didn't care for the Phalanx. Uh, well, I don't want to say necessarily even the first or the second time around. But I remember this was interesting simply because it was basically giving uh, Joe Madabrera the opportunity to riff on something very much like Akira uh, through the lens of a design that was, uh, you know, initially the product of Bill Sinkovich. So, you know, an interesting uh, pile of influences uh, that we see coming into the uh, 90s interpretation of the character. Or, see, that's the thing. It's not really a character. It's just like a uh, space threat without really any differentiated characters. Because beside the Warlock and the Magus, that uh, they don't have a lot of differentiation between different parts uh, of the, that species. And that's, I think, kind of a weakness dramaturgically. Uh, and maybe why uh, Claremont only really used them. Uh, I want to maybe even as... Uh, comic relief when the Magus shows up, even though he's quite a threat. He's a character that exists, and Warlock exists because Chris Claremont was just thinking of something fun for Bill Sinkovich to draw. And in, indeed, we got the spectacle of many more artists, although they did kill him for a while there, but Warlock still shows up, so you know there's a little bit of Bill Sinkovich's style, uh, DNA, in the, the very you know fabric of the Marvel Universe there. Uh, but, like I say, as a threat for the X-Men, like, I don't know, I understand now they've gone back and given me plenty of reasons why the Phalanx hate the X-Men in particular. But a lot of that stuff is honestly, you know, maybe because I re remember, you know, the Phalanx Covenant, where the Phalanx just weren't that interesting. So going back and making them you know, in hindsight, more important to the mythos than, than than they were really ever originally intended. I mean, that's kind of the nature of passing time and uh, serialized stories. Uh, but there you have it. The X Men they just they they have a whole cosmic wing of their stories, and it it used to be weird, but they've done it for so long that I I, can't, I guess people just accept that. Uh, they get to have a disproportionate say in you know, the planet's like foreign policy via via the universe. And I have to admit, I'm not necessarily dogging that because it's always made sense to me uh, in a way that I've seen other people say like, oh yeah, it maybe doesn't make sense that the X-Men just like, they fight a bunch of aliens or they go into space periodically. And it does kind of make sense if you go back and read the 60s stuff and see that the X-Men are dealing with... Uh, uh, you know, stuff that was pretty pressing in pop culture in the 60s, you know, alien invasion, infiltration. And the idea was always, oh, the X-Men are outsiders, and so they're sort of uniquely poised to see invasive threats to the planet from outside. And that's how this, the, the book frames it from the beginning of the franchise. And maybe that doesn't necessarily, uh, that, that thematic drumbeat doesn't necessarily get you know, beaten in the ear of Claremont when, you know, they get welded to this interstellar uh, politics with the Shi'ar uh, in a way that does, I think. It doesn't necessarily touch on what I was just saying, and it maybe seems a little bit extrin extrinsic, but now it's just part of, you know, the conflict uh, with, with the phalanx. You know, that's part of the, the House of X, Powers of X stuff is, is, is showing 
the relationship. Why? Okay, why is this random interstellar empire just kind of fascinated with these, these weirdos uh, in the Marvel Universe? Why not Spider-Man? You know, why didn't Lilandra appear in Peter Parker's dreams? Oh, because Chris Claremont wasn't writing Amazing Spider-Man. But, but for a couple twists of history, that might very well have happened in Marvel team-up. But it happened in X-Men. Uh, what were these? Oh, the Marvel Master Prince. I want to say that was... Was that the... Um, Mark Bagley got his own run of trading cards because that's what, if you were able to do it physically in the 90s, they gave you a trading card set. And, you know, they were pretty good. It was pretty... Once you figured out the trick, I think, you could do decent, striking-looking trading card images a lot faster than you could do a comic book page because you could, you know, drawing an image that would look good at small size, well, you could maybe bust out the big, the big markers for that, as Jim Lee taught us. <laughs> if you look at larger versions of some of the Jim Lee X-Men pieces, they're actually kind of interesting in there starkness, then it doesn't really stick out when it's just a trading card in your hand. And he figured that out. He figured that out really well. Was this the Marvel Mart stuff that everyone was so mad at them about when they were doing their own uh, direct mail sales? Uh, yeah, this got people upset. <laughs> if I recall correctly, that's what that was. Now, new from Marvel. Now, of course, I don't think I ever ordered anything here because, yeah, I want to say they were just going. They, they were selling for cover. But on the other hand, uh, they were selling a fair amount of catalog stuff that probably got some, you know, probably got some decent sales through this, uh, these ads. And they, re they still had Gru. They were, had two Ren and Stimpy trades. So there was enough demand for Ren and Stimpy material, you know, probably for... You know, parents of younger children who would buy, you know, five Ren and Stimpy comic books welded together. Yeah, and if, another thing that you don't usually see nowadays because they don't do uh, staple fillers like this anymore because it makes the comic kind of difficult to read. Um, now, of course, if they did it again and it brought in you know, fantastic uh, revenue. Well, you know, maybe they, they need to look at that one. But, you know, they were even putting stuff like the, you know, Monster Menace and Monster Masterwork stuff, which was reprints of the 50s uh, monster stuff, which they, you know, still had in print, even if only, you know, very choice selections. The Dinosaur Collection. I don't... Were these, like, epic... Or maybe this was a play for the educational market. Because I do remember seeing, just in passing, uh, looks like it's probably just, you know, semi-educational comic books about dinosaurs. That'd be something to find. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were doing a lot of this direct mail stuff. Okay. Yeah, big old Marvel Comics logo. I can see why the retailers were, were maybe getting a little bit uh, miffed at that. Uh, what do we got going here? I don't think I had any of this specifically. Uh, I had, or did I? I may have had an X-Men hat. I'm having some vague recollection of maybe having a, a brimmed X-Men hat at some point for, you know, wearing a, you know, down at the lake or something like that. Oh, maybe I had a, well, that Wolverine pin. That looks kind of familiar. That's maybe something I could have got in a stocking. Yeah, they were doing posters at a Marvel time. That'd be interesting to see what their Marvel timeline was in uh, 90, 90, this was 93, 94, I think. The future of Marvel Comics is now, and here's a Paul Ryan promo. I don't have this. I would love to have this poster, this original Paul Ryan 2099 promo. Uh, so, yeah, Joe Mad still drawn X-Men, still drawn the Phalanx. And the characters look great, even though at this point, 
I'm not anxious to go back and catch up with what's going on in these ward balloons. Uh, yeah, everyone, everyone loves Yukio. She's as quick to put a knife on you as anything else. All right, who is, who is that? The character with the really long black, this, you know, straight up anime girl hair. Who? who oh, more collectible than ever, as opposed to that period where we weren't very collectible at all from like, you know, 91, 92, 93. But, you know, they're still around. I got to say, I have mentioned this in the past. I get collectibles ads sometimes online. And the baseball cards as a product that they sell now don't make any sense to me. The, they seem like the, they're tiny packages with just a few cards in them, as opposed to, you know, like 15 cards and a piece of bubble gum. But I think they've gotten rid of the bubble gum by now at this point. Uh, so, yeah, oh, and there's the Beast and Jubilee. Something happened to Bobby. He drew a very astute beast. And you think, oh, well, the beast usually has hair anyway. Yeah, but he, he did the, the whole arm and chest hair thing, like Wolverine has. We'll come back to that. Uh, oh, yeah, is Sabretooth... Yeah, Sabretooth is hanging around the mansion for... A significant point, and he ends up, I think this is the period where he ends up basically being imprisoned in the danger room for, I want to say, a solid year. And then he gets out, and he almost kills uh, Psylocke and the doing, and that leads to that uh, Sabretooth special that uh, Gary Frank drew that is one of the most gorgeous comic books of the 1990s. I've sung that comic's praises on the TikTok, one of my very favorite X-Men stories. Uh, I know. Well, what would this show be without me finding reasons to talk about Gary Frank in the 90s? You'll be proud of me. I actually read a more recent Gary Frank comic book. I did not like it, but I try. Don't recognize any of these names. Oh, yeah, still too long here. Nightwatch. Nightwatch didn't last a year. I think they got like 18 issues or so out of X-Men in the early years. Don't quote me on that. They got a little over a year on Sabretooth Classics, which was some really uh, hangdog reprints of, you know, random Power Man, Iron Fist, and Spectacular Spider-Man issues where Sabretooth just happened to show up. Because he showed up a fair amount of times in the 80s. Marvel Comics Presents still trucking. Thunderstrike lasted two years. Ravage 2099, I think it lasted well over two years. Uh, still two Barbie books, but, you know, Barbie's a newsstand book. It goes away when the newsstand does. Beavis and Butthead. However long you think Beavis and Butthead lasted, it lasted longer than that. Hellstorm, which uh, ended up being uh, one of Warren Ellis' uh, very early influential runs. And Gru, but he, he Gru's just about gone. He's on, got his way, on his way out the door for a year at Image, and after Image, I, for some reason, he just doesn't get along well with the Image model, and he decamps to Dark Horse, and he's been at Dark Horse ever since. All right. How are we doing on time here? Oh, well, first episode of our new format, so to speak. So we, uh, we pandered. We pandered excessively so. What else we got? Oh, this is fun. It's not technically a comic book, but it was in the box. Uh, this is uh, when Topps, from Topps' uh, publishing line. Uh, Topps had a lot of, a lot of publishing in the 90s, which is not the uh, mid, mid to late 90s, is not when I would have chosen to got in, into publishing uh, collectibles. Uh, just wouldn't have done that, but that's what Topps did, and thanks to the foresight of, of Jim Salakra, uh, they they went a long ways with uh, 
what on paper wasn't a lot to start with, but they had money and they threw that money at licenses. And so Topps Publishing, which was not attached to the comics, uh, editor Bob Woods, uh, not a comics industry person, but yeah, this is separate from their comics division. But at the same time, you know, Topps wasn't in the publishing uh, business before the 90s, and they wouldn't necessarily remain in publishing uh, after the 90s, but straight up. You go back and you look at Tops and you see of oh, this company, they're spending a lot of money on quality licenses and quality talent. So you see why they didn't stay in the business for very long. <laughs> but yeah, they were also doing a lot of Star Wars at the time. They're the ones who did that series of Top Cow Star Wars vehicles cards. All right, so this isn't a comic book, although it does have a couple comics pages in it, so we're not going to go through uh, go through the whole thing in detail. But I actually wish, in hindsight, I had continued to buy this, because I want to say only about the first couple issues. Maybe they only had the first couple issues where, I because I think I want to say I got this at Walmart, and maybe they only had the first couple issues, or maybe I never found it anywhere else where I was buying magazines, because I probably could have picked it up at the comic book store. But uh, I only got to go to the comic book store so often. And if a magazine was available on the newsstand, I wanted to buy it on the newsstand. All right, so they're, they got a subscription form. What's one year of this? Thirteen ninety seven for a three fifty magazine. That's that's a that's a good deal. There you go. I, now this uh, they usually had decent letters page if I recall correctly. They already are getting emails in. What year was this? This is ninety five. Ninety five. Star Wars model kits. Oh, these, these technical journal magazines. Uh, these were Starlog products, but I don't think I ever saw them anywhere. I think they were, yeah, you know, I didn't always see Starlog uh, where I bought magazines. I could usually find Comic Scene because Comic Scene actually had decent, you know, people did interviews with Comic Scene. Uh, even though in hindsight, it doesn't maybe have the most substantial reputation. But uh, people talk to comic scene. So around the galaxy, Raiders of the Lost Archives. Oh, it's a book there. I remember when they put this out, this uh, first look into the Lucasfilm archives. So it had both Star Wars and Indiana Jones stuff at the time. Back when uh, Lucasfilm sometimes tried to you know, keep Indiana Jones uh, you know, on equal billing, but they, that didn't last very long. <laughs> And now, you know, uh, you can look back and say, well, they have been able to go significantly further with Star Wars and Indiana Jones. It's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> Indiana Jones, he never really had a, had a as big of a, a presence in the comics. His uh, comic book lasted somewhere in the 30s, in the 80s. It can only get, you know, uh, through the 30s, you know, on the newsstand. And to this day, has Marvel done has Marvel done a single Indiana Jones comic? Uh, they may have at some point. Maybe I just missed it, but it seems like that would be a big deal. Someone is barking. I don't usually have barking dogs in this neighborhood, so it's kind of a, a rare spotting of a celebrity. Someone's upset. Uh, something about lithographs and online comlink. In 1976, the words online was where you stood for hours waiting to get into a smash new movie called Star Wars. So wait a minute. This is issue one of Star Wars Galaxy magazine. And the person writing this is telling me that Star Wars came out in 1976. Maybe that's why I didn't buy the more of this magazine. Probably wasn't, but still. Wow, way to get caught with your pants down at 30 years remove. <sighs> Yikes. Uh, coming in April, Out of This World, All Aliens Issue. 
Who did this cover? This was Dave Dorman. I want to say that was a, was that a Sinkovich cover on three? I can't remember. See, Top's got good people to do. Oh, and they, there, here's a feature about the Energizer Bunny ad. I doubt they still run this anywhere. Well, they might. Or does Energizer Bunny uh, versus Darth Vader, does that still ever get played? Uh, people still know who Darth Vader is. So, collectible reproductions of Star Wars characters abound from plastic action figures to ceramic sculptures. Really? So yeah, here's an interview with Dave Dorman. He's already done a fair amount of Star Wars illustrations of the time. You know, some very, very famous pieces. Uh, you ended up seeing quite a bit from the Dark Empire uh, series he did. Oh, I remember these Job of the Hutt covers. These were fantastic. Ah, oh, man. Jim Woodring. If you don't know, it was Jim Woodring who has written more Job of the Hutt stories than anyone else, because he wrote the Job of the Hut features in the 1990s for Dark Horse. And I don't think they've done a Job of the Hut series since, or more than a one-shot. So Jim Woodring still probably has that crown. And I don't think Marvel has ever gotten any new Job of work. I mean, Marvel, if they wanted to, they could probably get Jim Woodring to draw Job of the Hut. Have they ever asked? The most obvious things never occur to people. He's not Star Wars. What's he doing here? This was from one of the one of the DC trading card attempts towards the real tail end when I was down to like maybe I'll buy like one or two packs of an interesting new series if you know there's good art on the uh, on the advertisement. But you know, a couple of trading cards here and there was. You know, trading cards can be cool. They they kind of went to the trading card well a bit much. I think everyone went to the trading card well. Man, you look back on it and realize, yeah, Dave Dorman did a bunch of a bunch of awesome stuff. Even that Tyson one is pretty nice. Oh, there's there's Indy. Uh, oh, uh, here is a interview with the scriptwriter of a, why are they saying 1976? Four years after Star Wars began dazzling movie audiences in 1976. There were, there were, I think, sizzle reels being shown at conventions in 1976. I think. I, come on, man. 13 part radio uh, play from, uh, 1980. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. With new Mike Alred. Illustrations. Very early. I think he's done more Star Wars since then. He'd have to. But uh, I, I want to say he also had a piece in the, the top Star Wars series, which was basically um, kind of like the Marvel Masterworks approach with Star Wars. Yeah, so that that's some Mike Allred that you might not have. Uh, reader survey. An original Star Wars role-playing game adventure, including all new characters, droids, and vehicles. By Bill Smith, editor, West End Games. Yeah, they were, I mean, you know, West End Games. This, this would have had absolutely no appeal for me at the time. I wasn't a role-playing person. Just didn't have a, a big enough group of kids near me that I could role play with. I lived out in the sticks. I rode along bus right into school. And uh, so role playing stuff was just DOA with me. It was, it was nothing. In hindsight, now I know, oh yes, West End Games, they're like, they're a big reason why Star Wars looks the way it does today. Because they were the people, they were the only people publishing anything with Star Wars on it. In the late 80s, they were it. Star Wars was dead. So it's just these guys who came in and sort of codified everything in the form of a role-playing game. And that, uh, that circumstance of them being the only 
Star Wars, ancillary publisher. That did not last for long, because as soon as the 90s clicked over, well, you had Dark Empire, Heir to the, uh, the, Heir to the Empire, all that stuff. Thrawn, Star Wars came back in a big way, and then ultimately they just started making new Star Wars. But West End Games, they were disproportionately important because they codified all that lore at the very dawn of the expanded universe as it exists still to this day, even if they restarted the expanded universe, just the idea of there being, well, this other part of Star Wars that exists in addition to. Uh, and before, like, you know, before 1984, 85, after the last movies, there was just Star Wars. And you had comics and you had some books and some weird Han Solo and Lando Calrissian spinoffs. But it was all just Star Wars. And then eventually there was just, there was more. So that's why that's that's an important name. If you see West End Games name on anything in Star Wars history, it's important. It ended up being absolutely formative for you know the, the whole field of Star Wars. Oh my goodness, the Super Games. I had them. I didn't have Super Return of the Jedi because I never beat Super Empire Strikes Back. It was too hard. Straight up, I was. A middling gamer. I gamed a fair amount. I had the home consoles. But my mom was the one who beat Super Mario World. I never beat Super Mario World. Maybe I just didn't have the commitment. I, I never beat Super Mario 64 either. And here are just screenshots of the Star Wars game, which, you know, whatever. Dark Empire, what was I just saying? Uh, perhaps overshadowed in history by heir to the, you know, the Timothy Zahn uh, trilogy. Really overshadowed in, in history. But at the time when Dark Empire came out alongside those those books, then I think they were more, this was more important at the time, and in hindsight it sort of faded. Because, you know, the, the 90s Dark Horse Star Wars comics maybe not remembered as well as like, you know, the late 80s Dark Horse Aliens stuff, or even the, the 90s Dark Horse Aliens and, and Predator stuff, which could still get good creators. When I think the, the, the Dark Horse Star Wars material, it's kind of settled into a, a rut by that period, just from my perspective as a, as a reader. I don't buy a lot of Star Wars ancillary material. It has to you know, at this point, after all the Star Wars, it's under the bridge. It really has to catch my eye. If Marvel put out a lot of Star Wars books that caught my eye, uh, I'd buy them. And it's a good month if I buy one Star Wars book from Marvel's line. Uh, so here's, uh, this might be interesting to go back to, the Al, Williams, uh, Al Williamson talking about his work on the Star Wars uh newspaper strip, which if you want to talk about an artist who had a disproportionate influence over the look of Star Wars, you know, there you go. George Lucas, he had a say in how everything Star Wars looked, especially in those early years. So don't, don't think that he wasn't chuffed to have one of the EC guys doing uh, his doing his newspaper strip, and doing his movie adaptations. You know he cared a lot about Al Williamson drawing his stuff. Oh, and it's one of these. Oh, a long time ago on this channel, we looked at a Tales from Mana's Eisley special, which was, you know, one of the rare Star Wars books I picked up. And I picked it up at the time because it had Brett Blevins art on it, uh, being written by Bruce Jones, uh, with, yeah, Brett Blevins inking himself. And they did a one-shot full of these stories that I guess ran in Star Wars Galaxy. Uh, I don't know, in the 20s, 30s, I don't know, a while ago, because I just didn't buy that many Star Wars comics uh, at the time. They weren't drawing my eye. But Brett Blevins, Brett Blevins draws my eye. 
Bring, uh, bringing brining. Oh boy, brining Star Wars special effects to the silver screen was a painstaking process that goes all the way back to the drawing board by Mark Cotavaz. Okay, well, who is the editor here? <laughs> Mr. Bob Woods. Uh, yeah, you got a lot of good artists under your masthead, but uh, I'm not seeing a designated proofreader. <laughs> Uh, so here's an article about Ralph McQuarrie, some a couple of the early Vader drawings, which you know we've all seen a gazillion times at this point. But back in '95, I probably hadn't seen these a gazillion times at that point. Uh, I mean, I grew up uh, with those, uh, the original documentaries that they would run on TV on the weekend sometimes when I was a kid uh, with the spe about the special effects for the Star Wars movies. Oh, those were always special to see. And, you know, now they're just available as, well, you probably find them somewhere to watch online. Uh, so, Tales of Phantom Toys. Oh, I remember this. This is something that might not be quite so well known. They were going to do another line of Power uh, of the Force toys at Kenner and it, they just by 1986 no one was no one bit on the last years of the Power of the Force line uh, I don't even remember seeing them because I was still you know I was still a kid but I was not buying Star Wars toys by then that was in the He-Man and Transformers and G.I. Joe no one was buying Star Wars in 1986. So they did the prep work, but, you know, basically it's just different kinds of Star Wars guys, and no one was buying any kind of Star Wars guys in the late 80s. And that's why, you know, West End Games had the, the field clear. Uh, so what is this? Cyber Notes. I attended an auction recently where the bidding was lively, the stakes were high, and the items on the block went for big bucks. I zeroed in on a real gym, but I wasn't alone and soon found myself competing with a mysterious bidder who matched my every move. I would have, I would like to have made eye contact. I would like to have made eye contact with my fellow inquisitor, perhaps watch him sweat in the heat of battle, but that was impossible. This was not a typical auction, even though I live in New York. Okay, nice humble brag there. Guy who's writing in, you know, issue two of Star Wars magazine. Uh, famous for fancy schmancy auction houses like Sotheby's and Christie's. This bidding was taking place from Steve Hoffman's apartment in Michigan. Oh my goodness. That is so weird. Because now, like that, you want to talk about things that have definitely changed. This is a massive cultural shift. Everyone now associates auctions as something you can do in your underwear while watching TV. That was not the case 30 years ago. That was a massive shift, almost overnight. Nowadays, the idea of going to a real auction, they sell expensive stuff online now too. <laughs> Ah, email auctioneer, swapping news and cards. So they're talking about, you know, all the burgeoning online scene. And of course, you know, if there's anyone who's going to be on the net in the early 90s, it's Star Wars people. With millions of users online around the world, cyber collectors agree that electronic networking is the way to go with this hobby. Uh, uh, based on the best-selling top secret trading cards, the Art of Star Wars Galaxy Volume 2. They put out a couple trades. Yeah, so they got some nice Star Wars art by, uh, you know, they had Ralph McQuarrie doing a text piece. Uh, they spent money to get good artists to do uh, collectibles at the point when pretty much everyone else, but maybe that was 
Maybe that was the point. So many other people were getting out of comics and getting out of non-collectible trading cards, the tops, which was always going to have their, you know, they were always going to meet their nut on baseball. Even, you know, thick or thin. So they had money to throw into the market when everyone else was getting in, in out of it. Maybe that was the, the logic there. But they didn't last the 90s. Yeah, see, there's some more Dark Empire images. Oh, and these are prints. Now, admittedly, you know, you'd be stuck with a print of, you know, what is a version of these characters that only exists in this, by now, uh, long, you know, struck from continuity. Although I think it's still in print. I think Marvel has kept all the witch straight up. I'm actually surprised, legitimately surprised by the assiduousness with which Marvel uh, has kept all the old extended universe Star Wars stuff. You can walk into a comic book store and find all the old, you know, Dark Empire stuff still in print. Uh, I mean, as, as in print as anything is in Marvel. But they, they just slapped a different logo on it, which in hindsight, yeah, man. Of course, they're still going to sell those Timothy Zahn books. They're just, they're not in the real continuity, but they'll still sell them to you all the same. And they ended up using, you know, everyone could have guessed that they would have brought Thrawn, you know, forward. Uh, and they did it in about as much time as I would have guessed. So, first episode, new format. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it does the trick. We'll see. I don't know. It makes my life so much harder. That's all I got to say. Uh, what are we talking about here? The things I go through for you people, for you wonderful, wonderful people out there in audience land. So please pass on the link to everyone you know to give this show a shot. Uh, tell your friends. Tell your relatives. People with whom you're not really quite sure how you stand, but maybe you want to get in on good graces. Uh, oh, have you come to say hi? Check out the uh, other shows that I'm putting on this channel where I look at new comics. Check out my daily comic book reviews on TikTok and Instagram. Check out the Patreon. That's how you can show your appreciation for this channel, for anything I do, for any channel. I post on or anything I write. Uh, check out my podcast with Claire Napier, Utter Madness on Top Cow Comics. Uh, we should have a new episode coming out when we both get our hands on the debut issue of the new Witchblade, which is soon. I don't know when, but it's soon. We're going to see. So look forward to that. People are obviously, you know, going to be demanding that of us, so we're, we're just going to head you off at the pass and do it, so you don't have to ask us. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, I, I haven't been on the journal that much. I just, uh, well, I've been recharging my batteries. It has to happen sometimes. Uh, most recent thing I, I have up there is an article on Rick Altergott, I should have a piece on Godzilla up at some point in the near future, but uh, that would entail me writing it. All right, have a wonderful day. Take care of yourself. Take care of the world. Keep your head up above water. And uh, have a wonderful day.